I am Eric Rowe, Principal of Prep Academy. Uh, this is my one of my sixth year at Prep, fifth as principal. Uh, we are a small alternative school um, that serves students um, who do not fit inside um, traditional uh, comprehensive middle schools and high schools, whether that be the um, regular one through seven bell schedule, um, scope and sequence, and a lot of the compliance measures of schools. Um, those, those systems and practices do not serve our students best. And so we have adjusted a lot of, um, in terms of our culture over the last five years. Um, and the last two, really thinking about our instructional model uh, to move from more teacher uh, centered to more learner centered um, practices. Yeah, and whole school next year will be that. So for us, it is thinking about how you, um, the, the, the common term is student voice and choice, right? But I think it's more around leveraging the relationships between students and teachers to co-create learning experiences or design learn co-created um, learning experiences for um, for the students as well as the teacher right so we think about the sort of mindset you would need to maybe think about your own practice differently um, that has to be that internal work of that educator first before we can start um, dismantling any sort of uh, systems or structures uh, within our school. Because uh, if you don't really believe that's possible when you're used to conforming, then nothing really is going to change despite some of those structures changing. So at the end of the day, it still boils down to um, the relationship um, or connection between student and teachers um, in the classroom or in the community. Our students are not allowed to ride DPS buses, so they catch public transportation at school. And some for some students, um, we're not a neighborhood school. We serve students who may be expelled or, or forced out of another school. Mm -hmm. um, and that could be a three hour bus ride, right? Yeah. And so thinking about attendance as one of those compliance measures um, that, that tells us how good of a school we are, we thought about, we, we moved to a late start or a slow start just to say, we honor and respect the humanity of our students. Many, they, they lead lives. Um, and expecting them to get here on time when they do not ride um, buses, um, school buses, was just one of the things that they advocated for and we changed. It was thinking about changes in the curriculum. Um, at one point, I mean, four years ago, I had students um, at prep warning, so they didn't see themselves or their culture represented except for a few quotes in Spanish on the walls, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and some express the idea of, well, well, can we learn to be translators and interpreters? Because I see Pope, you bring people to come in and they get paid to do that. So now next year we, we hired um, an educator who will teach uh, world, um, I mean, cultural heritage Spanish. So I think it's just, it's been those things, a, a sort of larger project that gets outside of the school context. Um, Solicio Lopez, who operates Student Voice and Leadership um, it's a youth development um, uh, project or program within DPS. Our students were looking at the school to prison pipeline, but particularly looking at the inequities around expulsions, like who gets expelled, and it tends to be black and brown males. And they wanted um, more clarity around the expulsion process and were advocating for a policy change to include a panel of youth advocates on that panel to be part of the decision making. Um, I think, but I would say this, these are things that should have been happening even before the pandemic. I think the pandemic now um, sort of accelerated um, the timetable of a lot of districts and schools. Like, you know, the lack of access to technology was not new, right? Um, the lack of, um, uh, the focus on standardized testing and now thinking about students demonstrating proficiency around uh, building a body of evidence to show that they have mastered content, right? Or proficient in content. That, that's not new, but just districts, schools, educators were reluctant to do any of that because I think it, it came down to um, do you have the capacity or skill to do it? And do you have the will to sort of shift your practice? Um, I think for us, 
uh, given the pandemic, it is probably, and we're a small school, but I think you can do this in a, in a large school well, as well. I think thinking about education happening in community, because my theory is, and what public health officials say, it is safer inside a building, right? With circulating air and close proximity, it is safer outside than rather inside. And so thinking about what learning can happen in community spaces, uh, thinking about um, field experiences for students, um, all for credit, all for work, but that's relevant uh, to those students. If you think about individual projects students can engage in or internships uh, to do career exploration, um, it could look like um, the first day of school starting in small advisory groups of, um, of 10 and maybe one or two adults, but one group starts at the zoo for the first couple of days of school. Another group starts at um, the art museum. Another group may start at a community organization um, that focuses on mental health and gardening. It's called Dahlia Campus here um, in Denver. But I think about that as ways to more intentionally build community than trying to figure out how to stagger kids coming into a building, you know, small groups at a time, small groups at a time, or part day instruction. So I think, I think there are a lot of ways you can shift around um, schedule and content to really get at teaching and learning and what skills are taught um, and, and to maximize and value learning that happens outside of school um, and outside the purview of a teacher. Because all, I mean, I mean, think about all the data. I mean, you can go back to, to as far as it's not that long ago. I think Nation and Risk came out in 65 and basically looked at the, the, the quote unquote achievement gap, right? And, and a lot of that was looking at um, the global achievement gap, right? Compared to um, other industrialized nations, right? The US compared to other industrialized nations. So like, we've always left kids behind. <laughs> always designed for one size fits all and, and typically not for um, students of color, right? Even though some students of color succeeded in that, like I, I'm, a, I'm a black man who sits here with uh, two master's degrees and an Ivy League undergraduate degree, right? I knew how to do school. I, my parents were both educators. Um, but yet and still, I, I am not the exception, right? I'm not talking about the boys telling the tip, I'm just saying, everybody should have those same opportunities and access, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it, these changes should have been happening and they've been discussed, they've been talked about. There, there are a lot of schools um, nationwide who, who have just put in a lot of good work around what a different type of school learning experience can be for students. Um, but we still got a lot of work to do. There's a capacity, like there, there, I think there's a, a direct difference in saying like, um, capacity, right? I don't have the capacity to, in order to shift my practice or the mindset to really understand um, a different way of doing things because we've always done it this way before. I was Got trained that. this way. I can't, this is what I think education is, is about and should look like and feel like. And if, if I did it, then students now should be able to do it. Okay, um, let's look at um, standardized assessment. And we make assumptions about populations of students, typically black and brown children, and trying to solve for this problem of why do black and brown children consistently show up as behind in terms of um, not meeting benchmark scores or standardized assessments, right? And so if, the, if you go into that mindset of thinking, um, you know, that, well, there must be something wrong with the kids because we don't question the assessment, we question the kids, right? at one point teaching to the test was in vogue, right? I think it still is, just it gets called something different now. Mm -hmm. um, not questioning those systems and seeing the lack of, um, uh, seeing the disproportionate outcomes that come from that sort of one size fits all or that deficit thinking about children, that's a, that's a huge blind spot. And that is an example of institutional racism because basically you are casting this wide net around and, and generalizing um, some data points to an entire group of people. We don't, and we still rely on standardized assessment to a large degree. 
Um, we still make the assumptions about students when they don't do well on assessments. Um, and so I think there's a lot of systems and policies that we can look at that really should just be done away with, right? Um, to use Bettina Love's um, version of this, she calls it abolitionist teaching. Um, abolitionist teaching. And so, yeah, mm -hmm. something should just be abolished and not come back. Because it's harming, it's harming the futures of children. You can think through critical race theory. You can look at um, uh, critical queer studies. Like, what's the lens? You can look at women's studies. Ethnic, like, what is the lens um, that, um, or in, in, in a lens and also a lexicon for students to really talk through what they are seeing, experiencing, reading, writing about, right? So how do you really analyze these things? And then the other, the other question is, okay, on the other side of that, um, what can you solve for? What are some alternative solutions that you can present? What's a, what's a perspective that you have on, on, on issue X? Um, and how can you address that in some substantial or significant way, right? Because a lot of times we tell students, well, just wait, you got to learn this stuff first. And then, you, you know, once you get to college or after college, you'll then do, do the work. And really, students are not asking for that right now. Mm -hmm. they're, they're asking right now, we want to be engaged and involved. Um, and I think they've always been asking for that. We're just used to silencing um, any form of student dissent or student voice. And many of them were asked, what do you want your education to be? Not like, well, you go to high school and you graduate, then you go to college, then you graduate from college and you get a good job. Why am I studying this stuff? Why am I studying algebra? Why am I studying history? Uh, why am I studying the same old content over and over again? It's not relevant to me, it doesn't mean anything. And we, our typical response, which was not sufficient to that level of questioning from students, right? Or critique really, was, well, you need to do this because you gotta get ready to go to college. What if I don't wanna go to college though? Then why is it relevant? What if I wanna do something different? And we, we, we've not really, in, in education, we've not really, um, not that we've never done it, but I don't think we have consistently, or that, that is not a, a um, we've not commonly or routinely acknowledged those questions from, uh, from young adults, right? We just sort of conform to what we know education should be. And for those students who don't conform, um, we also produce policies to get them out. When I was in, when I was in undergrad, um, uh, Professor English, Rest her soul, she just passed, Lydia English. Um, we read Up From Slavery by Booker T. Washington and Souls of Black Folk, W.B. Du Bois. And she wanted to set up in one of the classes a debate, right? Because there really was a debate going on between these two, these two scholars, these two learned black men around um, um, the, the fate future of black folk at that time, right? And, and I remember writing um, in preparation for the, the discussion we're going to have in class, um, that I, I didn't want to get in, I didn't want to choose sides. Like I didn't want to be team WEB and team Booker T, right? Like I, cause both at the time, I, and I will say this, were, had a theory and idea that they were presenting now around how to navigate in, in largely a white world. Maybe choosing a side and criticizing both, right? Um, whether you want to disagree with uh, Booker T's idea of a talent intent in terms of certain folks, individuals sort of um, who are exceptions to the rule, or if you wanted to argue with Booker T's idea of um, um, some folks saw it as uh, sort of tracking folk into, into labor. <laughs> So going from slavery to like industrialized labor, right? Um, and that's not what he's advocating for. But I just said, if I think, if you think about it, why get into a debate of, of either or and maybe think what the real issue was? These were two black men trying to help other folk navigate through white supremacy. And the real issue is like, can we have a, can we have some honest conversation about how white supremacy characteristics, culture? There's some debate about those two terms operates 
in, in, our, in American society, and particularly within our institutions, whether you're talking about uh, police, government, criminal justice, education, economics. Um, the ideas of, of white, white supremacy still persist. And so even if you can say you, you had a, as a person of color, you had a stellar um, K through 12 uh, journey. You went to um, Ivy League institutions, post-secondary, and you may find yourself sitting on a board of directors of a Fortune 500. At the end of the day, racism still exists and persists. Even though there's some individual success that a few folk of color may enjoy, right? Yes. True that there's not one system that's been dismantled. Season how it plays out to create disproportionate outcomes for uh, folk of color still exists. And, and we haven't attacked that at all. And we tend to, and I, I share that story just to point out, we tend to look at um, sort of these outliers of success as see, that's not really what's happening. It's, it's, there's not a such thing as just racism. See, anybody can make it, right? And so this fallacy of like the American dream, like anybody can make it, no matter where you come from or where you start. Well, that's not really true. It's, it's ongoing, but really thinking through how you dismantle systems of power and privilege and create systems um, and institutions where everyone can thrive, no matter how they identify and walk in the world. What, what experiential education does, and it, it's, um, not only is it best practice, <laughs> right? If you, and if you look at neuroscience, it's like, how do you learn anything, right? And so I, I think part of it is, it's not just experiential education, it's also recognizing the lived experiences and the stories we all come, um, come to the table with, particularly in education, right? Um, so having conversations around, um, I think about, let me, let me back up. I think about, um, Paulo Freire has this quote in Pedagogy of the Oppressed. He talks about um, folk in education, either you believe the purpose of education is to help for folk conform uh, to this sort of vision and way of, of, of life, mm -hmm. or, you believe the purpose of education is to help them, help folk or provide opportunities for folk to, to practice um, education as practice of freedom and liberatory pedagogy, right? Um, you can draw a parallel between that fairy quote um, and Ibram X. Kendi's idea of um, racist and anti-racist, right? Like there is no in-between, right? Are you, are you supporting of um, education as practice of freedom and dismantling um, racist policies and practices and institutions? Or are you just going to remain silent and just conform? Mm -hmm. Right? And so you, it, education does have to be a practice of freedom. And, and as you think about um, your role as an educator, you, you, you can't sit on the fence. You cannot aid political. Teaching is a political act. Education is a political activity. It's not, um, it's not passive at all. It, it's small steps, but, but I, and our students, and, and they're very aware. I mean, when, when you get expelled from somewhere, like there was a choice that got made and, and the student did something that, that violated a policy. But I, I've also seen some students who have been expelled for, you know, continually walking hallways or being truant, right? Mm -hmm. They don't attend school regularly. Right. Um, they're disruptive and they're loud. They may cuss a little too much. Um, and and there, there are stop gaps for that. But, but here, here's the thing about this. I serve a student population that is largely male in terms of African-American male and Latino students. I do not have a school full of you know, I, my demographics are not equal, <laughs> right? There, there's, not, there's not a wide distribution of folk getting um, expelled in, in Denver public schools. So the question is, why is that? Why, why is it that, um, that, that young men of color are disproportionately expelled or disciplined in Denver public schools? And I think across the country, because we've got data to show that. Mm -hmm.
So if there really was um, um, equality in terms of how discipline policies get handled, if there really was equity in terms of the type of ways instead of punitive, but restorative practices in place, right? I think you would see some very different outcomes. But currently our students know very, very well that when they come that they are largely being discriminated against by the school district in which they are enrolled. Mm -hmm. And they're aware of that. And to ignore that ignores their lived experience. So it's not just about the experience of education. It's also taken into account um, student agency and voice and choice, and also being very explicit and intentional about can we apply a critical lens to um, systems, to practices and policy? And then what, on the other side of that, again, how do we change or shift? A lot of my students, not all, um, by society, society criminalizes their behaviors. And I think that's very clear and evident from the, the, the recent events in the news, whether you're talking about George Floyd, um, now Rashawn uh, Brooks, list of names. Like, mm -hmm. there's just a criminalization um, and over-policing of black and brown bodies. That, those sort of stereotypes and, it, and, and, and those perspectives don't stop at the school door when students come in. I, I'm going to just... I don't, I don't really want to talk about those things that's happening out there. I just want to teach my content and teach my kids. Well, well, or I don't see color. I see my kids as all the same. Now think about that. But you, you may serve, a teacher could serve um, 150 students daily and teach and work with them daily and say 30% of those students are African-American. Um, another 30% are indigenous. Another 20% could be biracial right? Another 20% could be uh, Latinx, but yet you have an individual, whether they are uh, a per an educator of color or white, who could, who could easily in, in, in our schools, in our, in our current school structure say, well, I don't really see color. I'm just going to teach my content because all my students deserve equal access to content. Mm -hmm. Well, you've simply just said, I am not recognizing the humanity in the lived experiences of 150 kids. So that, and, and that happens routinely in a lot of spaces. So you, you have to see it. There's no more excuse for like, well, I don't see color. Um, because by actions and mindset, well, you do see color quite clearly. <laughs> the school to prison pipeline is a real thing. Mm -hmm. And I know there's, there's debate now, um, there's, there's been ongoing debate about the role of, uh, of police officers in schools and school resource officers. I, I've worked in schools, um, in public schools largely, where there's been uh, one or, or two school resource officers, right? And, and those officers, those law enforcement agents were built great relationships with kids. Uh, they were professional. Um, they, they swore and lived up to the, the oath that they swore to protect and serve. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not disparaging about, um, individual officers, but in terms of a system and criminal justice, you, and in terms of legalities, police officers do not randomly come into schools and give out tickets, right? They just can't come in and say, we're going to execute a search. That's done by permission of district administrators and school level administrators, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so if I'm a teacher and I'm having problems with a student, the first response should not be to, if you're an educator and you say you love all children and you all children can learn, great. But if your first response to a, children who, to a child who needs support is, I need to call in an SRO or a dean or a safety officer to right. come deal with the child, right? You are contributing to the school to prison pipeline, right? You, mm -hmm. you are not, you're committing violence because at some point you know that um, that officer or individual who comes to the room um, most likely is probably going to detain that child, possibly put handcuffs on a child, 
those things happen in schools. And so that doesn't happen without those actions being initiated by an educator, whether it be a principal, a teacher, a dean, AP, and the like, or counselor. I mean, if you if you read like um, if you read um, Dr. Eddie Ferguson, he's at Temple. Um, he 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 writes and works in school districts um, across the country around looking at disproportionality outcomes of data, and he talks about sort of a an inoculation, like that first booster shot, right? And then thinking through experiences along the way after that first initial sort of shot, as you start to shift mindset and, and, and show folk and develop them, develop different sets of what he calls replacement behaviors, right? And so it's, it's, it's not as simple as um, going through um, an anti-racism curriculum or a set of PD sessions, right? Mm -hmm. This is lifelong work. It's, it's about Definitely. shifting it's about shifting mindset and, and, and your professional practice and educator and seeing the humanity in others, recognizing humanity in others, and also finding um, your own humanity about how you see the world and treat others, right? right. And, and sometimes, depending on in, in we, we like to talk about preparing students for the real world, well, in the real world right now, um, Black folk have been continually getting shot and killed by police um, who've been unarmed. And I think for us to, for folks to turn a blind eye to that reality, that um, Black folk in particular are seen as more dangerous or more criminal, simply by then the color of our skin, right? You, you, that's not gonna be a, a retraining session, right? <laughs> At all. It's, yeah. it's all change. I, I think it's, you know, if, we, if we're, I mean, if we're talking about, um, and, and not just, like I said, the pandemic did not cause this. It just, it just, I think, and I heard this before, it accelerated. If you think about schools with a high um, free and reduced um, lunch demographic, right? Mm -hmm. So breakdown of food, of the, of the supply chain, of getting food from farm to market to homes, right? Like that got accelerated as, you know, folks are getting COVID and meatpacking plants, right? And Mm -hmm. um, it's 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 kind of hard to sort of get food, and people have lost jobs. So, the things that the, the systemic inequalities that exist in American society, schools are a microcosm of American society. American society. So, yes, we do reading, writing, and arithmetic and tests, but now would be a good time to maybe rethink where we spend our like taxpayer dollars in terms of the school budgets that we that we get as districts um and then as a school leader from the district to the school like how how can we really break up some of these um or address these systemic um inequalities that exist around food around safety around public health around um health insurance employment right so the, the time is right now to really rethink all of that um, and do better and create, again, a system where everybody can thrive, where we just don't accept, well, some people will, some people will be successful and make it and live and thrive and others won't. Right? So like, if we're not going to do it now in the middle of a pandemic and the continuing fight, I say continuing because this is not new, mm -hmm. for racial justice. Okay, so then when? If not now, when? You could be funding other resources and other in terms of human capital um, um, and, and equipment in terms of deploying social workers, um, um, homeless advocates, providing shelters for folk. Like, again, some people are guaranteed housing, but then there are a whole lot of unhoused folk, right? Mm -hmm. There's not enough affordable housing. And I, I think, again, we're arguing about the wrong thing. Defund, redistribute funds, all those terms, one to shock, defund, right? That's intentional use of language. Redistribute, well, certain segment of folk believe, well, that's just, that's a transfer of wealth and we're against that, right? But what if we just said, wait a minute, what are we really trying to solve for here? What's the right thing to do? Like, we, 
there are some inequities that exist. And so how do we take funding um, and take public tax dollars? How do we do public-private partnerships maybe in a different way to think through how we solve for some more intractable problems we haven't really addressed? In education, in housing, in, in public health, health insurance, uh, crime, and, and maybe redefining what safety really looks like and redefining what education, teaching and learning really looks like in our schools. And we, those questions get lost, I think, um, because I don't know, we, we tend to spend too many time arguing with others who don't agree with us mm -hmm. and trying to persuade them around semantics and in and, and a lot of the terms in the meantime, folk are literally dying. So great, if you, if you say you're gonna, um, if, you, if you're gonna say the defund or redistribute um, uh, resources or, or reimagine what public safety looks like, great, do it. But um, failing to act because you think some people are gonna be offended by your choice of words, yeah, not, that doesn't hold a lot of weight. If, if there's a crisis, the first place people go to, politicians and elected officials go to in terms of defunding, it's education. So when, if, when people talk about we're gonna cut back on services, they, the first place people go to find money, public education. I mean, if you, if you take a sample of the news and, and look at governors talking about making adjustments to the budget, well, you, you, they're starting with education first. They don't start with the police. Right? They don't start out with fire. They don't start out with, they start in education. And, and we've accepted that. Like, oh, well, just, hey, do more with less.